standing up there uh, between the shore and the water. Uh, I've got goosebumps all over telling the story. And she just froze when she saw the one on the ground. And he thought, oh crap, I'm a dead man. I just killed her kid. <laughs> Goosebumps all over telling the story. Um, so the good thing about this lake is it's mostly like in a straight line. I mean, with curves. Yes. So it's like, curved. you know, if you were to just try to explain it, you know, just with you know, just with with verbally, what? How would you describe where we should be going? You should go up the lake uh, like you're going. Okay. Uh, you know, when you get out the marina, the, 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 the you know the entrance. Well, um, so so right now we're coming. You know, we basically left from the marina, did like a straight shot, and now we're the the river's about or the the lake's about to turn to the left from our perspective. Yeah, so you want to go if you come around that bend, there's a hollow that goes to the right. Oh, okay. Like like immediately after the bend, or no, on up. You on up. up around the bend, go up around like you're going up the lake. Yeah. And you'll come up to a, a place up there. On the right, another hollow to the right. Yeah. Up in that hollow, they get to the right. All right, so Andrew, we're here in Braxton County. We're here because uh, there was a sighting a few years ago, a Bigfoot sighting. A guy came with some Bigfoot sighting. So, can you tell us a little bit about the area in the lake? We're here on Sutton Lake. Yeah, so uh, we're on the Sutton Lake, but uh, the Sutton Lake is actually uh, the, a flooded Elk River. So the Elk River starts up in Webster County and comes in down through uh, Braxton County and then is dammed in Sutton, creating this reservoir. And then the Elk River keeps going uh, to where it meets the Canal River in Charleston. Yeah, so according to the, the, the witness, uh, up around the bend here, not too far away from where the, the Sutton Lake Marina actually is located, um, there is one of those branches that that comes off to the right. Yeah. So the, the witnesses described uh, fishing in one of these little finger areas of the lake, not too far from the marina itself. Right. And uh, since it was at winter pool, so right now we're at summer pool, so the water's coming right up to the vegetation. Right. In uh, the winter pool, that comes down and it's just basically rocky and muddy kind of depending on the section but no visitation and according to the witnesses um, where they were just setting fishing with their boat still they looked out an outcropping not too far from them right. and there was just this tall figure 
standing there watching them, basically. And he said they, when he, they were casting, and then when he seen it, he said, Are, do you see this? And then to his buddy, and his buddy said, yeah, I do. And uh, they, they sat there and for a few minutes and watched it. And uh, it eventually just turned, it eventually just turned it like to its left and walked away. Yeah. And now I know that one of them mentioned uh, the possibility of going to see if it may have left Prince. Yeah. And the 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 the, uh, the friend that was with him decided that that wouldn't be a good idea. So yeah, they and just decided to leave. Yeah, yeah. So, but like, uh, so I know you spent a lot of time in the wilderness here. I know that we're not very far away from where the marina is. Right. But if you were traveling by land, about how much time do you think it would take to get from more or less what we would call the civilized world to get to here? Back here? Oh, it would. It would be tough. I mean, you got to go all the way to the back around, back to probably to the very back where the, the elk actually comes in, and then you would have to hike a good ways down through there. You may be, you may be able to take some of the railroad track down into part of it, um, and then hike off it some. But so yeah, pretty it, much all hiking. No oh driving. yeah, no, it, it would be more. It would be all hiking. Okay. So I mean, basically, if you wanna, if you, you know, would like to actually come to like this area of the woods, your best bet is by boat. By boat, yeah, because it's, it's steep, hard, especially winter. Now, winter pool might be a little different, you know, because you, the water gets down lower and you're actually able to hike some of the bottoms, you know, to get here, yeah. to get into some of it, but still, it, it's a good hike. And then, again, I don't, I don't know how, like some of it is flat, but then you have some of just sheer wall, so you would have to get it past that. Right. So, it, so are we coming up to it right here? It should be by the map he sent us. It should be coming right up here. Okay. So people missing in Alaska. Uh, this is a hot topic because it happens pretty frequently. We have something called uh, Inukun. It can take you. I don't know where they take you. They're dark, like black. They are hairy, kind of like a Bigfoot. Is it possible that some of these missing people go missing because of another monster, the Sasquatch? I think it's entirely possible um, because Sasquatches are not your forest friend. They are animals trying to survive. If Sasquatch really wanted to, and in considering people like me or, or even just people in suburbia, if they wanted to, they could push people out of rural areas back to population centers. A lot of the Alaska Native, the superstition is that if, if you're in their territory, they will take you. And they were just hanging out in the cabin. Well, they heard a noise up on the roof, and then something was going on just outside the door, and it lured them out. Death by Alaska is real common. You get a mile away from the village, that's death out there. Alaska can kill you without even trying. In the heart of West Virginia lies picturesque Braxton County. And in the heart of Braxton County lies the town of Sutton, no more than four miles from the geographic center of the state. From its very beginning, Sutton positioned itself as a point of connection, a hub city situated along the banks of the Elk River, a location served by turnpike and railroad 
with the Sutton Branch connecting to the West Virginia and Pittsburgh Railroad at a place called Flatwoods. After the devastation wrought by the Civil War, Sutton was revived by the rise of the timber industry, enjoying a time of prosperity that lasted until approximately 1920. World Wars, the Great Depression, and other factors considerably dampened the economic boom. But the natural resources remained. And in 1961, Sutton Dam was completed, a project decades in the making. With the dam came Sutton Lake, and opportunities for recreation meant visitors to Braxton County. By then, the county in general and the village of Flatwoods in particular had become household names, thanks to the national coverage given to the strange events that unfolded there in September 1952, involving UFOs, an iconic green monster, and a small group of witnesses willing to tell the tale. However, this was hardly the only unusual tale to be told in central Braxton County. For years, there had been whispers regarding the Old Man of the Mountain, a large, shadowy figure that was apparently more than a legend. This notion captured the imagination of people like Les O'Dell, who were not content to simply pass along fantastic stories, but wanted to make a serious effort to investigate the possibility that they could be true. It also occurred to local resident Andrew Smith that the experience of the Flatwoods eyewitnesses was part of Braxton County history and as such ought to be preserved and retold in a way that would attract visitors to the region. Today, both Smith's Flatwoods Monster Museum and the West Virginia Bigfoot Museum, which houses many examples of Odell's research, stand in Sutton, West Virginia, as prime examples of the great good that can come from taking one's local weird history to heart. My name is Andrew Smith. I run the Flatwoods Monster Museum here in Sutton, West Virginia. That is um, located just down the street from the West Virginia Bigfoot Museum, also located in Sutton. You know, another connection that I have to the strange and unusual is uh, just being in a place like this all the time, like nearly every day for the last five years. It feels like at least once a week or once a month or so, somebody that has had some sort of experience ends up finding their way in here. And since I'm associated with sort of the strange and unusual, I think they just start off with automatically like, oh, this guy's familiar and comfortable with weird stuff. So I'm gonna tell him my strange encounter story that I don't tell anybody else because I don't want him to think I'm crazy. Well, my name's Laurel Petalico, and you are in Sutton, West Virginia at the West Virginia Bigfoot Museum. And um, we're standing in it. <laughs> How long has the museum been here? And can you talk us through sort of the evolution of it? Well, it was kind of a funny, yeah. So we own an old fashioned country store that is basically a consignment store that just has all these handmade stuff from the local area. And we didn't have these two rooms done. It was just that main room. And we have these guys come in with just their handicrafts. And one of my guys is a wood carver. And he came in and he brings in owls and bears and you know things like things that he sees. And the one day he came in and he brought this big statue, which actually he made this one as well, but it was the other one in our in our museum that he made. And he brought it in and I said, Oh, you brought me Bigfoot. And he's like, No, I didn't. He goes, We don't have Bigfoot in West Virginia. He goes, This is not Bigfoot. And I said, Well then who is it? And he said, Well, this is the old man of the mountain. And I'm like, looks like Bigfoot. And he's like, No. He said, Bigfoot lives out west, they're mean and nasty and nobody likes them. And I'm like, well then, what's the old man in the mountain? <laughs> and he said, um, he said, well, it's a really large animal, it's larger than a bear. And he said, but you can't eat it and, and nobody cares because they're not aggressive. So he said, nobody pays them any mind, but he said, they're kind of nice to have on your land because they keep bears away from your livestock. 
And so it was standing in my, I, I just didn't really take it seriously, but it was standing in that store and people were walking in off the street going, oh, the old man of the mountain. I have eight of those living on my land. Or, oh, we trade with them every year. Or, oh, I just saw that three weeks ago when I was fishing or when I was out hunting. And it was just story after story after story, but they called it the old man of the mountain. And I'm showing them pictures of Bigfoot and they're all like, yeah, that's him. And I'm like, guys, this is Bigfoot. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 it's not that. Because they're not mean. Because they've been seeing the Hollywood versions and thinking that it had to be a mean animal. And they were like, no, no, it's not mean. But so that's kind of how it started. And David's like, I think we have something here. And then we met Les Odell, which I understand you're gonna be talking to him later, but um, and he just, he came in and got a picture with the statue and he's like, I finally caught him, you know? And he said he was looking for a place to put his um, collection of Bigfoot tracks, which are the ones behind you there. So we kind of started with that other room. I said, well, we're finishing off that room. Would you want to display them here? And he's like, sure. And so then he introduced us to Daniel Smith and then they introduced us to Dr. Meldrum and it just kind of became, became a thing really fast. <laughs> Old man of the mountain. So I'm curious, um, can, well, I guess, can you just elaborate on that some? Talk about, you know, why do people call it that? Have you taken any reports where someone referred to it? Now? The first time I really heard about it was when I, when I came here to Sutton and, and, and Braxton County. Uh, it's not big for Sasquatch, we, we just call it Old Man of the Mountain. And then after she told me that, I started looking into it a little bit more. And it seems to be a term used by a lot of older folks. Uh, same as like in other southern part of West Virginia where they call them boogers or wood boogers and stuff like that. But it just seems to be just a term that a lot of folks around here use to describe what they've been seeing. And I mean, there's even somewhere, I haven't found it yet, but I guess there's a, there's a road here nearby that they actually call Monkey Road because of sightings that happened on that road. How many uh, people do you think uh, come through and tell you about their own sightings? It is crazy how many do. And usually it's these old mountain men or ladies or something and they'll come up to the counter and they'll be like, do you really believe in this? And I'll be like, well, yeah, I do now. I mean, like I honestly didn't when, before we moved here because I just thought it was all a big Hollywood joke, but I know these people. And I mean, like the guy that says they're living on his land, I know him, I worked with him. He's not a town drunk, he's actually in law enforcement, you know? <laughs> and uh, local businessmen and preacher's wives and, you know, professional people that are running into these on a fairly regular basis in this area. Because in this area, the particular, I'm not even sure what you wanna call it, a troop, I guess, um, is very non-aggressive and is used to people. So they interact often with the local people and hunters and things like that. So it's amazing. They'll come up to the counter and they're like, do you really believe this? And I'm like, well, yeah. Okay, let me tell you my story. <laughs> and then they tell me their stories and it's just unbelievable like how many people have had encounters with these in this area. Yeah, 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 that was, that was actually a really fun topic. Um, so back after the Flatwoods monster, what, what is really known as Braxy, the Flatwoods monster incident, that was the UFO encounter followed by creature sighting. This, uh, another Braxton County monster and Flatwoods monster reared its head and it was actually a, a, a series of Bigfoot reports and they were dubbing it as the Flatwoods monster again. That's what the newspaper was coining it because it already made headline sensations previously. So why not call it the Flatwoods Monster again because it's going to sell papers, right? Well, these sighting reports were oftentimes taking place around Sutton Lake. And you were getting a lot of reports coming from that immediate area. And the, it took on a whole new life of its own. I believe in 1961, there was a, um, a case that was reported on by a, a delivery man and uh, funny enough, it was reported as the return of the Flatwoods monster, or maybe the return of the Braxton County monster. I'm not exactly sure exactly what wordage they used. A, a delivery man that was coming back home after a long day on his route in the road uh, near the, the Flatwoods area. I don't think it was actually in town Flatwoods. Um, it was just in that area. He came around a turn and was met by this large uh, Again, dark figure, I think he described it as being about eight feet tall, scared the daylights out of him and it, it ran across the road. And when he got home, um, you know, he was completely terrified and told his wife. 
and actually the way I understand it, in the newspaper, it was his wife, I think, that was recounting the story and not him directly. So when you mention, depending on what circles you're in, you mention the Flatwoods Monster, you're gonna get a split reaction. Some people are gonna remember it being a Bigfoot story, other people are gonna remember Braxy and the alien story. So when you start looking into those, you've got multiple names. You have the Braxton County Monster, you've got the Green Monster, which was Braxy, you've got the Flatwoods Monster, then you've got the Phantom of Flatwoods. All of those things are all the same thing except for the Flatwoods Monster gets a second title for Bigfoot. Are there still sightings over by Flatwoods in Sutton Lake? Yeah, yeah, there was a, a sighting report just um, here in the last couple of years, a, a, a guy that Ron and I both know named Jesse. He had sent that report in to, uh, I think he sent that to Les Odell as well as us. He was out fishing, they were out catfishing and they had, they had heard something across the, the way of the, the lake from him. And it, it wasn't so much a sighting report as, was, as much as it was just all auditory. It seems like about half the stories that I've heard relate to having Bigfoot-like encounters, but to where they don't necessarily see anything. Um, like the one that I told you that happened on the Burnsville Lake. Um, there's a guy that came in here. He doesn't live in town anymore, but he used to live here in town in Sutton. He would have trouble sleeping at night. And there was one night that was like 3 a.m. that he took his dog for a walk just down through downtown Sutton and that uh, as he was getting close to sort of all the way at the end of Main Street, it kind of starts becoming forested again. And he said he, as he was walking, he could hear movement in the woods that was slow and plodding, but also kind of loud, and that it kept up with him. So as he walked for like a quarter of a mile, it, this movement stayed with him. And at some point he got really scared and turned around and came back and that it followed him pretty much the rest of the way um, until he got to um, an intersection in the road where the woods wouldn't just keep going. You know, it was interrupted by a road and then he stopped hearing it. Um, so he, he felt like that something was more or less keeping an eye on him and he, he felt like it was Bigfoot. You know, obviously we don't know, he didn't see it. Um, but stories like that are kind of common too. I've taken uh, one of them was in 88 or 89 by a man named Sam. Uh, he was visiting from another state. I believe it's called Meadow Lane, but it's right along the Flatwoods Run that dumps into the lake. Him and his cousins were out deer hunting. You know, he'd been there all day and nothing happened. So, they, you know, whenever anybody was going to move, they would whistle like a whipper wheel to let, you know, let each other know they're going to move. So he whistled. And he got no response. And he whistled again, got no response. And he said, well, to, him, you know, to himself, he's like, well, my cousins went back to the house, which apparently they did. But as he was getting ready to go, you know, back to his grandmother's, he started smelling this, like he, I think he described it as a mildewed, wet dog smell. And he stopped and he seen this thing running through the woods. And he said it was the size of uh, Andre, I think he called it, he says Andre the Giant. Uh, all covered in hair, but it wasn't dark. It was more lightish, brownish color. Um, but it went through, running through the woods, just breaking uh, saplings as it ran. And he said it covered like 100 yards in no time. I forget what year it was. There was a guy that I met here recently, or a couple years ago, and he said he was deer hunting nearby and he was sitting in a tree stand and he's seen a deer run along this ridge line and right behind it, this, this Bigfoot creature was following it running as a deer turned and went over the bank down the, other, the opposite side of the ridge, the, the Bigfoot followed him. So there, there's a wild man story um, that was published by the Evening Telegram in 1919 that was printed in Florida of all places um, but it reported a Bigfoot sighting in Flatwoods. Sorry, I shouldn't say a Bigfoot sighting, a wild man uh, sighting. It described a pretty detailed firsthand account of a gentleman that was on his way to a lodge meeting. It didn't specify which one or anything like that. He said that, that on his way, but that he heard some sort of loud commotion 
on somebody's property that they, that they name by name, um, or off the, the top of my head, I can't remember the property owner's name. I will say I've never been able to correlate that with anybody in Flatwoods, but from 1919, I don't know that I'd be able to anyway. But um, so here's this sort of you know crash bang, and he you know so he pays attention to that, and um, as he's as he's looking at this this property, this. Uh, this man comes running toward him that he describes kind of almost like a caveman like the way he's described is like a, a big a big man that's uh hairy but he doesn't describe him as being completely covered in hair as we would think of sasquatch or bigfoot but but hairy and wielding uh, a club and that he was basically screeching and and yelling not making any you know legible words or anything like that and uh and I think he even describes uh, pulling his gun to either shoot him or shoot at him, um, at which point it runs away, and that's pretty much the end of the story. Um, I, I've never been able to find any local accounts of the same story. Uh, but yeah, that is a, a wild man account that takes place in Flatwoods of all places. As far back as the 1790s, North American newspaper accounts used the term wild man to describe large hairy humanoids being encountered on the fringes of civilization and in the vast wilderness of the new frontier. The word itself reflected the expectation that the figures being seen were undomesticated and therefore unpredictable and potentially dangerous. and it presumed that the figures were, in some fashion, human. After all, they moved about on two feet, leaving five-toed footprints, possessed features like long hair and beards, occasionally used crude tools, and were witnessed in both child and adult forms, all giving the impression of humanity. Adding to this perception, were the oral traditions of indigenous people from coast to coast, which told of giants living in secluded, forbidding places. While native regard for these beings varied widely, ranging from beloved guardian to fearsome cannibal, in most cases they were thought of as human, in a broad yet recognizable sense. Indeed, the understanding of the Chehalis, whose language gave rise to the anglicized term Sasquatch, was that they were a large, forest-dwelling people, with which they had once enjoyed closer contact and even communication. In the 1860s, the reading public of the Western world thrilled to true stories of an incredible creature called the gorilla and the discovery of a real great ape had an immediate effect on the assumptions of those witnessing mystery bipeds in the woods. By 1869, American newspapers began using the word gorilla to describe what just a few years prior would have been called a wild man. With this shift came a new way to interpret the data surrounding Sasquatch and a tendency to refer to them as primates, based in part on evidence, behavioral patterns, and the rising prominence of scientific methods in popular thought. Hundreds of years after the first published reports of wild men began to circulate, the question persists. Is Sasquatch person or primate? Man or beast? Or could it be that it inhabits a category all its own? You know, there's certain things that when we take reports, I would say in general that we're all seeing. And commonly, most common, you know, they're, they can be an all collar similar to coyotes, but most commonly it's going to be dark collared, brown, reddish brown. Most of the time when you're looking at the hairs under the microscope, there's going to be a red tint to them. They are hair covered, but less so on their face. They have longer hair on their forearms. They will have 
a little bit of wrinkles around the eyes. The arms are longer proportionately than what you would see with humans. That's why with so many of us, a lot of times, you know, we can just look at a picture in an instant and tell that, you know, it's not proportionate to, or it's too proportionate to a human. And, you know, we're able to recognize it like that. It seems like at least what I've heard, although I know that that stories vary and, you know, I'm no, I don't really dive deep in the Sasquatch. Most of what I know about Bigfoot kind of just comes to me passively. Like I, I encounter it passively. I don't really reach out for it, but, but it seems like a lot of the descriptors are like that it's dark and that it's so, it's so dark that I, I rarely hear uh, people mention actual features. It's more like just sort of a, a, a shape, you know, a general shape where you can see like a head, shoulders, arms, legs, but like that outside of that, there's not a lot of detail. Yes, very uh, human-like, uh, hooded nose, everything, uh, larger brows uh, around the brows, more eyes offset, larger, which is characteristic of not being, you know, more nocturnal. Uh, sometimes a conical head. A lot of people don't say a lot about the conical head. And I've had people say that, they, I've had a couple of reports, they said they had fangs, but uh, others they didn't. Uh, I've had reports where they're huge, uh, bulky, and I had one guy in North Carolina that said it was tall and lank, and very lank and uh, very thin. Long arms, longer than normal, shorter legs, longer torsos, re no neck. Everybody says they turn their whole upper body to turn their head. Extremely agile. They move quick, silently. They walk with hardly any lower upper body movement. And they say it's just amazing how fast they are. We've had reports come in that people will see a, uh, a large 12, 14 foot creature covered in hair all the way down to, you know, something that, that would almost fit the bill for a puck wedgie. You know, this small diminutive furry creature um, but, and, and everything in between. Uh, the ones I think that stick the most, the, the, I find the most interesting are the ones that say that they have a lot more human features. They look more like us than what they expected is one of the words we'll be told is they're, they look a lot like us. It was more human than animal. It varies. Uh, some people see what they describe as an ape-like thing, you know, uh, walking on two legs, you know, ape-like long arms. Some people describe as slender, uh, almost human-like in a way sometimes, or a human shape, more human shape. Um, others talk about big, you know, just being bulky and big. Very, colors vary, uh, black, red, light brown. Uh, patchwork, kind of, in, in a way. Uh, a few white ones, a couple white ones. Runs a gamut, I guess. Normally they're seeing something large, seven to nine feet tall. Large, like he said, large shoulders, um, massive arms and legs, long hair, usually brown, black sometimes red, and we've had reports of white Bigfoot. In this county, there's been four sightings, okay? Two of them were from New Cumberland, and it was on a ghost website, actually, West Virginia Ghost, and it was of a white Bigfoot. Now, we had talked, I think, before about the white Bigfoot. And one in 90, ours too, 94 and 99 in New Cumberland. And in both cases, this huge, white, gorilla, ape-like looking creature, they, see, they saw it like going through the woods, knocking over, like knocking over things, tearing through the woods. I mean, it wasn't just a, like a, it was just looking at it. It was tearing through, it was like hell bent to do something. And the, and the, and the kids ran away in both times. White, any, have you taken reports of white? Yeah. Do you, can you recall the details? Uh, one was in Logan or Lincoln County, 1996, a young lady was 16 years old without mushroom hunting, you know, morel mushroom hunting with her, with her uh, family. They were splitting up in the woods. She went one direction, and her younger daughter, or younger sister, mom and dad went in other directions. And uh, she's walking along, and she hears a, a grunt, and didn't realize, you know, what it was at first, uh, or didn't know what it was, and then she heard it again, and then that's when she realized or she looked up, or well, she heard the second grunt the second time, and then she heard a, a, a stick crack. 
and she looked up and realized she's five foot from this tree, five or six feet from this tree. And when she's panning up from looking the ground for mushroom, looking on the ground for mushrooms, she actually sees two white, white hair covered feet, dirty white hair covered feet beside the tree. And it, she looks up and notices this thing has its hands wrapped or its arms like wrapped around on the tree. And it leans over and looks at her from behind the tree. And she says, I took off like a chicken with my head cut off and took off running. Um, the other one was in uh, Mingo County in 2012. Uh, a fellow, a younger boy, younger guy, you know, teenager or late teens or whatever, uh, snuck out of his home to go see his girlfriend at three o'clock in the morning. He's walking back home. Uh, there was an abandoned property like on his way home. And they said that the property had been let go. You know, there was grass was real tall in it. But there, for some reason, there was a motion light on his house. And he noticed the light kicked on a couple of times and he wasn't in, in the uh, view of the light or whatever, the range where the light would kick on from him. And he noticed something white and hairy. It looked like it was actually bending down in the yard, grabbing something that was eating. And he thought it was just some somebody in the yard. So he yelled at it, he said, hey. And when he did, this thing turned around and looked at him. And he said it looked very much like an ape type features in the face. And it, it screamed at him and took off running on all fours, jumping and bounding, chasing him down. Uh, and he said he ran all the way home, thought this thing was going to you know, chase him all the way home, but it, he realized it didn't, it didn't fall him very far. But it was, it was also white, completely white. The other two, we received the one uh, off of North Fork, North Fork Road that uh, two eyewitnesses, this happened about, about five years ago. Uh, we, I, I investigated this last, last year. They were walking down a, uh, a clear cut and a power line and up on the hill that you know would go up on the next on that next hill this huge uh dark figure was it must have been on on all fours because it it arose they saw it rise up and they said it was it was the shoulders are massive and in, in, in some of our reports that's what these people are saying they're like you know brian the, the, the shoulders they look like a linebacker shoulders they're so big and, and i think that's what also makes some of these reports a lot compelling i mean the, the the width not just the height of these creatures the width of these creatures is immense and they said it's massive massive and so this creature looked at them really quick and it ran off into the woods yeah i'm curious are there are there white bigfoot uh sightings in in west virginia i've never taken one i mean everything that i would hear like i wouldn't be surprised at all for one to be grayish collared and someone may call it white or whatever that wouldn't surprise me, but I mean, most of the time when we see albino, you know, and we're not talking about white one being an albino, you know, we're talking about it just being a lighter collared one, but in nature that wouldn't really jive, you know, that would make that animal that's, you know, supposedly trying to stay hidden all the time, you know, that would make it, you know, more obvious for someone to be able to see us. Also, if you can actually tell, tell us what the Grafton Monster is. Well, the Grafton Monster uh, is this bizarre description. Pop culture has kind of grabbed a hold of it and given it a whole new appearance. But the original sighting report was this gentleman was driving around a, a very tight turn. Keep that in mind. It's a very tight, very fast turn. And up out of the creek was coming this large, wet, object and it was gray he described it as looking like a wet seal but he didn't see a head it just looked like a large hulking being with no head and the sighting last maybe a second pop cultures ran with that and now you know you've got big eyes in the the pectoral muscles and a big smile in the belly and we've we've seen so many depictions of it but in my opinion it was a misidentified bigfoot i honestly think it was a bigfoot after talking to, uh, you know, me and Joe talked this over multiple times. And it makes more sense to me that either that was a Bigfoot or that was some kind of, I'll say it again, some kind of intelligence that this man interpreted as what he saw. And I say that just because of the reports that they heard the weird humming and whatnot after the incident. Um, that doesn't really go with a flesh and blood creature. So, You've got the two choices there. You've got, A, it was a Bigfoot that he just, you know, misinterpreted, it was wet, or B, that was something else 
that wanted him to think that it was a possible Bigfoot. It, it was a road crossing, your standard road crossing sighting. It was coming up out of the creek and it was wet. And because of the posture of these things, oftentimes, it does look like they don't have a head. If you, if you go back into some of the uh, Native American stories, they talk about Valley of the Headless People. You know, they talk about uh, the headless giants even. And very well could be talking about Sasquatch, just that they're slouched over and the head is kind of more positioned in between the shoulders than on top of the shoulders, like ours. This encounter that we're, that we're kind of checking out, it, is it uh, sort of a one-off occurrence as far as people having an encounter with, with Bigfoot? No, there's, I mean, there's some historical accounts that go back in the 50s and 60s, um, but I mean, the, the ones I've taken, they were from the 80s, which was where we seen the uh, lower flatwoods run back there. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman was there along, along that deer hunting in like 88 or 89. Um, there's been some vocals caught in this area, or caught along the lake. Uh, I did take another, well, it wasn't necessarily a report, I had somebody message, you know, send me a message that said that uh, uh, him and his wife were actually back in one, back here somewhere kayaking and they watched something going along the shoreline and it kept throwing things and hitting their boat. They couldn't see what it was but they, they were hitting, hitting the kayak. Um, they don't know if it was hitting with little rocks or what it was. Um, that was a few years ago. Um, how long did like how how long were they like while they were kayaking? How long did the, did that interaction last? It didn't seem like it was too long. It was like a, like a few minutes. No, it wasn't seconds. It was like a few minutes. Right. It was like actually like they were um, just in one area, a small area, like a small tributary or, or finger of the, of the lake. The way they talked, they went up into the stream a little bit and they started seeing something along the bank. It was up out of sight and it was a shady area and they couldn't really see anything but they kept having things hit the water and hitting the boats like little, they think little rocks or something. If you had to guess, how many accounts have been reported on the Sutton Lake or, or like and uh, surrounding you know tributaries? I've taken at least probably close to half a dozen. Oh, you personally? Yeah. And how I, many do you know of that's even outside of what you've taken? Uh, some of the older ones, uh, like the Oil City one, or, or is, it, is it called Oil City? It, right. Oil Creek. I'm not, I don't know why I said Oil City. It's Oil Creek in County, 1978. Okay. Uh, 53 years of age. Now I can still recall an encounter while bow hunting near Burnsville. That was near okay. Burnsville. Um, then they had a guy to contact me a couple years ago. Said he was on his way back. I think from Florida. No, North Carolina. He was. He lived in Florida now. He was on his way back from North Carolina and he saw something tall and like hairy, I guess, mm -hmm. along I-79, the junction of 19 and I-79. Okay. Yeah. Did, uh, based on the amount of <clears throat> activity that you're aware of that happens around this area, what would be your guess? And maybe you wouldn't have a guess at all. But what would be your guess is like, what, what would a population look like? Yeah, but I wouldn't say there's a huge population here. Like maybe a, like a family unit? Mm, maybe not even that. Because mm. I've never, I've not received any reports of multiples. Okay. Uh, they'd always seen, and they were, they're so spread out that the, the, the uh, sightings, you know, as far as chronological, they're spread out, a lot of them. So I'd say it's either, this is just an area that they, some, uh, they're maybe coming into, or maybe it's an area where they travel through or there's just maybe a small, I mean, one or two maybe. I don't think there's very many. It's definitely, I mean, there's, I don't remember how many acres it is, but we're like dead center of the Elk River Wildlife Management area as far as yeah. on the lake. And now the, the previous owners of the marina have, had told me many times that uh, they, they've had several folks rent boats specifically yeah. for searching for Bigfoot. Right. And that, so that goes back years. Um, yeah, and there was somebody that, oh, I forgot about that. I think I, you and I talked about it before, that I told you somebody said a friend of them, a friend of friend or relative or something was up here on a boat and they actually had, like, there was a couple big logs come thrown off the bank and hit the water. I didn't hear that story. I thought I told you about that a while back. 
Yeah, but that's interesting. That's a, that was several years ago. I Again, were they described as like? They didn't see like, any, like too big for a for a adult man. Yeah, they did. They didn't see anything. They just said that there was logs. Right. They, they come out of the, uh, you know, because you see how steep the banks are. Yeah. So yeah, they can come from pretty high up yeah. and still make the the river. One guy called me, I think it was two or three years ago. Said he he lives along the wildlife management area mm -hmm. uh, in Centralia said that he was hearing screams and howls coming from near his property on the wildlife management area. So we're on the we're on the Sutton Lake right. and the, the Stony Creek leg Think, of it. Yeah. And uh, so this is where they were fishing and they had their encounter. Yeah. So Stony Creek, judging by the map and from what I can see is 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 actually kind of long sort of uh, finger on the lake. Um, do you know roughly how deep like away from the main part of the lake they were? Um, well, it, it was during winter pool, so it was, you know, the water was down, it's usually like 40 or so feet down. So... So it probably wouldn't be near this long? No. So It, it would have been the stream coming in, the water had been way right. down. Uh, he did talk about that they were 150 yards away from what they were seeing, which would probably be from here to that boat. Oh, okay. So we came to the location. Yeah. We got to look at the location. We got a feel of where this sighting may have took place. So why don't we head back to the marine and we'll give the fellow a call. Okay. If there is such a thing as conventional wisdom regarding the nature of Sasquatch, it is safe to say that it breaks in the direction of true cryptozoology, which is to say, it favors the idea of Sasquatch as obscure animal. It is stated by many with confidence that Bigfoot is a North American great ape, an unclassified primate, an assertion based on the interpretation of evidence, eyewitness testimony, reported behavioral traits, and the disciplines of zoology and anthropology. In other words, it is a reasonable hypothesis rooted in observation of the material world. However, given the fact that a specimen has yet to be obtained other hypotheses jockey for consideration, which often focus on the apparent human-like qualities of these mysterious figures. Drawing on the wide spectrum of indigenous traditions, some posit that Sasquatch, while not strictly Homo sapiens, are best thought of as an alternate branch of humanity. The annals of documented reports are filled with accounts of hunters who refused to pull the trigger on Bigfoot because the creature seemed more human than ape. Moreover, a growing vocal contingent argues in favor of a supernatural origin for Sasquatch, using biblical terminology such as Nephilim to describe a human celestial hybrid. However one interprets the term Nephilim, which is often translated as the sons of God, the other half of the equation in Genesis 6, the daughters of men, is universally regarded as a reference to human women. Therefore, the Sasquatch Nephilim hypothesis claims at least half human status for the beings in question. In a way, these contemporary examples and their competing assumptions harken back to the early newspaper days when the folksy term wild man was quickly shelved in favor of the zoologically precise term gorilla. Perhaps the transition was too hasty and the move away from the wild man moniker also represented a move away from relevant details that support the perception of a man who is wild. What might a return to those details reveal? I mean, I've, I have found them, newspaper articles, you know, in West Virginia mentioning the wild man, like just about any, just about like anywhere else you could. 
Uh, some of them you can clearly tell that that's what they were. They were just like somebody that went off and, you know, off the deep end and kind of went insane. Uh, a couple of the others, uh, there was one in outside of Morgantown. Um, I forget the year, uh, late, I think it was late 1800s, but I, I don't remember, for, remember exactly. Uh, there was a train coming through, through in the Morgantown area down, there's an area called Okapiski, and this train's coming through, and there's a guy along the tracks, like they thought he was trying to rob the train, I hold the train, he starts shooting, so they actually pull, you know, stop the train, they basically arrest him. Well, the, the next day, or the next, I think it was the next day or the, a day or two after, they're coming through the same area, and they think they're getting held up again because rocks are starting to hit the train, and when the conductor finally stops the train and gets out to see, you know, to apprehend this, you know, person or whatever, it realizes that this guy doesn't look like a normal person. He's basically completely naked, uh, bristly, blondish hair all over his body, and he actually tried to uh, get some of the passengers to help, <laughs> you know, apprehend the fella, but uh, no, they didn't do it. He ended up this uh, wild man or whatever and went back into the woods. But you get so many different stories about what they look like, you know, as far as, you know, you'll hear gorilla looking, uh, you'll hear chimpanzee looking, you'll hear some say they look like a, uh, a, a cross between some kind of um, primate and a Native American, or they'll just say it looks like a, you know, a feral human or something like that. But uh, I don't really know. I mean, it's hard to kind of pinpoint it down. I mean, don't you always judge that too? Like when you see a picture that someone does of a Bigfoot, does it look too ape or does it look too human? Because you'll hear people say, more commonly you hear people say that it is more human looking than ape looking. Yeah, and then of course, you know, I always hate that one, they, that statue that they have for all the gardens, and I have it in my house too, but it has the nose being pushed up like that. And of course we know that there's no way in the Northern Hemisphere that an animal would be like that. You know, he would have a pushed down nose, you know, because of, we don't have the high humidity, you know, it's not a tropical rainforest. You know, your nose will be trying to warm the air before it goes in. So Bigfoot always have a hooded nose Sometimes you'll see people show the large nostrils, but I suspect that the animal is so much larger than the witness or seeing them at an angle that they were able to see the nostrils. But I think that's really just the nose being hooded. You know, they're always talk about a little bit of a brow ridge. The hairline changes. Sometimes there'll be a higher forehead. Sometimes it's a little bit lower. Eyes being dark, very dark in the pupil. Interestingly, you know, I've only had a few witnesses that talk about being able to see any white around the eye at all. But quite frankly, you have to be so close to be able to see that. So I think that most of the time, they probably have a little bit of that, but it's just a darker, darker pupil. The teeth similar to um, a human's teeth, you know, without the canines. I mean, you hear some reports like that. I've just never taken any. And that um, most of mine would say that it was uh, like horse teeth or just big blocky teeth. The inside of the mouth being dark um, I took one great report where the witness was very close and she said that it was light and dark on the roof of the mouth inside. You know, I think that it's, they're probably similar to humans in that, you know, we all look different, but you would recognize and say that's a human. There is one, it's sad. Do you really want to hear it? Yeah. So this was from our neighboring county. Big dude comes in, I mean, and he was a mountain man of mountain men. I mean, he was huge. And he came in and he slammed his hand down on my counter and he's like, you don't really believe this crap, do you? And I said, I do. And all of a sudden he started crying. And I'm like, what the heck is coming? <laughs> I'm like, oh no. And he said, I gotta tell you my story. He continued to cry and he said two years ago, He's in the neighboring county and he lives, he has his traditional land. I mean, in, in West Virginia, a lot of the land is passed down for generation to generation. And he said he's grown up on that land. He's been a hunter all his life. He's in the woods most of the time and his hollow that he lives in is way out there. He said the way it's situated is farmhouse is here, 
barn is here, chicken coop here, there's a small little tiny field right behind the barn and then the wood line and the mountain that goes up. And he said that every night this stupid bear was coming down off the mountain, going across his, his yard and taking a chicken. And he got it on his trail cams on his porch that was like, you know, <laughs> um, he was, that was gonna stop. He was like, I'm done with this bear. So he was sitting on his porch with his gun and he was waiting for this bear to come again. And he said he did something that he knows is so wrong. As a hunter, you always wait till you see what it is before you shoot it. But he knew it was gonna be the bear. So he saw the black fur coming out from around the barn and he shot it. And it went down and he ran out there thinking he was gonna see a bear laying on the ground. And it wasn't a bear. He said he freaked out because he said it looked like a man in a ghillie suit. And he thought, oh crap, I just killed somebody. And he said he's looking at it and he said all of a sudden his brain's trying to process. He said ghillie suits don't have anatomy. And there was this six foot creature on the ground with male anatomy and he's thinking, what the heck? Because he didn't believe they existed. And all of a sudden there it is. And and it wasn't as big as he thought it would be. And he was just like, I've been out in the woods all my life and I've never seen, he says, I would have laughed at people if they told me that there was such a thing. And he says, I just killed one. And he said, he was just trying to process that, but he said it felt like he'd killed a person. Like he said, he just had this overwhelming dread because he said, I kill things all the time. He says, my freezer's full of the meat that I kill. He said, this felt different. It felt like I'd killed a person. And he said, it just was overwhelming me. He said, I'd just gotten my cell phone out to call the sheriff to tell him I'd killed somebody when there was a huge noise at the edge of the forest. And he said this really large female stepped out of the forest and she just froze when she saw the one on the ground. And he thought, oh crap, I'm a dead man. I just killed her kid. And he said, I just started bawling. And he said, I'm bawling like a baby. And she's walking straight at me. And he thought, I am going to die today because she is so big, this gun will not stop her. And I deserve to die because I just killed her kid. He said, that's what it felt like. All I could think of is if it was my kid, I would rip me limb from limb. She walked right at him. She stood on the opposite side of the little one and just looked at him. And he said the sorrow, he said, I, I was crying too hard to see whether she was crying, but he said the sorrow just felt like it was hitting me like a wave off of her. He said, that's all I can describe. He says, I can't even tell you whether she was crying I just knew she was sad. And he said she stood there for a bit and looked at him, and then she picked up the little one, looked at him again, and then just whirled around and just walked back into the forest. And he said, I called the sheriff anyway. He said, I just felt like I had to. And they came out and they're like, what do you want us to do? You know, <laughs> there's blood on the ground. What do you want us to do? And he said, I feel like I killed somebody. And they're like, we can't report this. So they left. And he said he spent the whole night in his house just freaking out because he just felt like he was so sad that he'd killed this, this lady's kid. That's what he said it felt like. And um, in the morning, he went back out to the corner of the barn, and he said there was this large rock that had been placed over where the blood spot was with this wet hand. And he said, I will not move that rock. <laughs> he goes, I don't know whether it was a peace symbol, whether it was a memorial, whatever it was. He goes, it's not moving. But yeah, those are kind of some of the, that's one of the stories that we hear. Yeah, the story I've ever heard. Yeah. And he goes, I now believe. I do not know him. He did not want to leave his name because yeah. he was like, I don't want people bothering me. And he goes, now I know they're there. And he yeah. goes, I really don't want them bothering them because yeah. he said, she should have killed me. He goes, if it had been me, I would have killed somebody if they killed my kid. And he said, she should have killed me and she didn't. We, I, I mean, I've heard a few stories, but like when people say they see them, it's almost like they can look in their eyes and they can tell that this thing has an intelligence, you know, or in it and seems like it's actually understanding what what you're doing and it's kind of reacting to that uh they would there was a one uh, the guy actually pointed a gun toward it and it actually put his hand up because it didn't want it didn't want to be shot or there's been other accounts where there's been like two and one would be irate i you know angry or whatever at, at this, the the witness and this other one would kind of like do certain certain things to kind of diffuse the sub you know the the uh the issue there that's kind of uh, to me a kind of a human type thing i've taken personally three reports here in west virginia where hunters had clear unobstructed shots with their gun and could have killed it and had large enough caliber weapons to do it but 
You know, you don't go into the woods that day thinking you're gonna see a Bigfoot. That's what people initially see when they see a Bigfoot is they just see something upright and they're not expecting to see a Bigfoot. And I was thinking right offhand of two of the three hunters that I've talked to that had clear shots that could have shot at a Bigfoot, if, you know, assuming that they had the right kind of rifle to do it. All three were during hunting seasons in West Virginia. And um, all of them initially when they saw the animal drop their gun because they thought it was a human, you know, because they were fearful of, you know, pointing the gun at a human. Um, but then it didn't, some of, something about it didn't ring right with them or ring true and then they pulled their guns up to look again. Uh, a, fella, a guy got a hold of me, he, he lives down in, in Pocahontas County, and he, in 19, I think it was 1996, him and his buddy decided they were gonna go to Dollar Saws and they wanted to hike some trails, and, and they decided they wanted to hike out to the Roaring Plains area, which uh, has some big over, rock over looks and stuff like that. Uh, they were actually uh, decided to camp on a uh, pipeline right away, and it's right off, and there's the trail that takes you to the Roaring Plains. Well, they're a little ways away from the trail, and they had been there for a couple days, and his buddy, for some unknown reason, decided to drink some of the water that runs, because there's a little stream that runs through by the trail, decided to drink some of that water, and then the water, I mean, it didn't treat it, didn't boil it, and if you've ever seen that water or the waters here in Blackwater, it's it's brown. I mean, it's got the tannins in it from the peat and the, and the pine and the stuff like it. Just and it just uh, not good to drink, you know. So he was drinking it, and they decided they were going to hike out to the the Dover Look. And as they're going, his buddy starts to get sick, and he's like vomiting, and so he's like, "I'm going to go back home. You know, I want to go back to the camp." And he, he, the guy is telling me, he said, I, I just told him, go ahead, I'm going on out to, to overlook and I'm going to, well, he done what he wanted to do and he's heading back to the camp and about 50 yards or so from the tent, he hears somebody, hey, and it's his buddy laying over the bank, like off of the right of way. And he's, he's thinking, well, you know, or he's sick or something and he needs help. Well, he, he, his buddy says, like, okay, come on, get down here, get down here. And he gets down there and he said, you, you see that, look down. And, and he looked down toward the tent and that's when he saw these long hairy legs backing out of the tent. And when this thing stood up, this guy said, the only thing I could think when I saw it, it was a big naked hairy man. And he said it was all covered in hair, but not real thick, you could see skin through it. And he's like, so I'm thinking, someone's messing with our stuff in the tent. And he r starts to run toward the tent and he's yelling at it and at this, this guy, this big naked hairy man, and he, the, the, it just goes running, crashing through the woods, just runs through the woods. So his buddy finally comes down to the tent. And he's like, I wanna, I wanna get out of here. He said, no, we're not, we're not packing up this late. We're not gonna hike out in the dark. You know, we're gonna, we'll stay here. So he talks to his buddy into staying and they start a fire and they're in the tent and then sometime during the middle of the night, his buddy like nudges him and said, hey, you know, it's back outside or, or you know, your buddy or whatever he called it. And he looks out and he could see the silhouette between the fire, you know, on the tent from the fire. So it was close enough to the tent that it did that. So he actually unzips the tent again and yells at her or, or whatnot. And it runs back through the woods again, takes off through the woods. The next morning they get up and he's they're getting ready to fix breakfast, and he notices this thing standing over in the wood line. And he walk, he goes, he gets up and he walks over, trying to get closer to it. And he finally goes over to it, and he actually grabs it by the, like on the arm. And he said, uh, he asked, uh, I forget what he exactly what he said, but he's like, hey, what are you doing here? Or who are you? Whatever. And he said this thing tries to mimic what he was saying, almost like it couldn't speak you know, English or anything, but just mimic, you know, like somebody trying to, you know, learn for the first time. And then the, this thing takes off again. And and so they decide that, you know, they're going to still eat breakfast. I don't know why they're still sitting there. With you, but all this time, this guy's like, I'm thinking he's a big, naked, hairy man. And But he did tell me that um, his education was that he was an anthropologist. And, and he told me that, he asked me if I knew what a Denisovian or a Denisovian or however you say it, uh, he asked me if I knew what that was. I said, yeah, you know, kind of I do. And he's like, well, they were small, you know, hominids. They were small stature. And, 
and he said, but this thing was big, but the facial features were like that, almost like a, uh, I guess a caveman type. He said, that's what he said. So he didn't call it a Bigfoot or Sasquatch or anything like that. He just called it that big, hairy, naked man. And he's, so they're finishing up breakfast or, or fixing breakfast and he looks over again and here comes this thing with a small deer on its shoulder. And he squats down on the other side of the fire, slams this deer down on the ground, and actually rips the front leg off this deer. And he starts chewing and eating on the, the raw deer as they're trying to eat breakfast. And that's when they decide, hey, this isn't, this isn't normal. And they, uh, they packed up, and then it, it left, and they packed up and took off. Did that account come to you through the website, or did you meet the guy? Uh, no, he actually called me. I, I spent two hours on the phone with him. Talked to him for about two hours. I mean, historically, you know, there's about, you know, about every three years there's a Bigfoot kill. This is just, you know, reports, so I don't know how many of them are true or not true. But, I mean, I remember that in the 70s, late 60s or 70s, two students from a high university were in Idaho. They thought that they were looking at, you know, an elk rooting around, and apparently it was a Bigfoot that was kneeling down, messing with something. And they'd shot it through the spine, and when they went there that, uh, you know, it was dead, and it looked too human-like. So they made a vow, you know, that they would never talk about again and it was about 10 years ago one of the guys had died and the other one flew back out there and then went to law enforcement and they went and looked and you know I mean I can barely find my camera sometimes six or eight months later you know the woods changes and looks different and I can only imagine after 40 years you know you just couldn't find it and frankly I mean what are you going to find I mean all the bones would be gone maybe some teeth or a skull might be there maybe you know what I mean if you would dig around if you knew the exact spot but everything else would be be gone. Is Sasquatch man or beast? The question itself expresses a fascination and a wonder that is often absent from the comfortable routines of everyday life. Likewise, any potential answer is staggering in its implications. If Sasquatch is man, then it is human in a way that we are not, uniquely at home in the natural world. If Sasquatch is beast, it is an animal with unparalleled physical abilities and uncanny evasive skills. Even the possibility that no such creature exists is cause for major introspection for if that is the case, how does one account for centuries worth of sightings, not to mention decades of collected data, such as footprint casts, to think that the entity called Sasquatch consists of a stew of misidentification, altered perception, and outright yarn spinning, hoaxing, and lying is just as dumbfounding as the thought that it could be real. However, no amount of intellectualizing really matters to those who have come face to face with Sasquatch. For them, puzzling over the question, man or beast, is of some value. But the question, is it real, has become irrelevant. They know what they've seen and the impact is profound, a challenge to their own humanity. Hey, I'm sitting here with uh, Les. Uh, I'm going to let him holler at you a little bit. Hey, you remember you remember talking to me a couple weeks ago? Yes, I sure Okay. Do. What I want you to do is with as much detail as you possibly can about your encounter. Uh, about uh, 2000, I think around 2007, in that time frame, uh, it was in the spring, early spring. Uh, it was at Sun Lake. Uh, one of my buddies and I went bass fishing. Uh, the lake was at uh, Winter Pool. Um, we left the marina and went up the lake. 
went up the first hall up to the right. I'm not sure the name of it. They were just up there fishing. And <clears throat> the boat, uh, we were just casting. The boat was kind of sideways in the, uh, I guess, what a, the channel went up the, the valley. And it was kind of an open area that went up. And it, the lake kind of took crook to the left and took to the right. We're casting, and I, and I talked to my buddy, and I said, hey. And I know more than got, hey, did you see that out of my mouth? And he goes, I see it. And um, it's standing up there uh, between the shore and the water. Uh, I've got goosebumps all over telling the story. Um, I, I, I felt, really, that it, it didn't care, because when we saw it, it stood there and looked at us. It stood there. And, I mean, it felt like it was a long time, but it, I know that it was two or three minutes. Um, it stood there and looked at us, and then it just turned. It turned toward the lake, and it just walked right directly back up the, not into the woods, directly away from us on the, between, halfway between the water and the shoreline around the little bit just directly away from us. Can you, can you describe what, what you were saying? Big brown was uh, probably, I would say, between six, five, and seven foot, I would say, probably. Um, it was, had long hair. Uh, it was, the hair was darker at the top as it went down, it got a little bit lighter toward the bottom. Um, it was definitely, you know, I've been around my whole life. Um, I've seen bears. I've seen bears that walk on their hind legs. Uh, this this was no bear. Um, this had, you know, I could we couldn't see its face very well, make it out because it was probably about 150 yards away or so. Um, but uh, it just. You could tell the way, it, as it stood there and watched us, then it turned and it just walked away and walked up around the bend on the lake, uh, away from us. We couldn't see it anymore. Um, it had, it just, it had an upright stature. Um, it, it had a, uh, it moved fluidly. It went like it was, uh, you know, a bear would have waddled or wobbled or, I mean, it was just more of a human gait type, but it was big, like, a. I can't explain it. <laughs> That's the thing is I can't explain what I saw. So um, we, as it, as it left, we were kind of just just beside ourselves because we didn't know what we saw. We saw what we saw, but we didn't want to believe it because before in the past, I can tell you right now that if somebody told me this story, I'd be like, yeah, right, whatever. Can you can you tell me like? I know you didn't see the facial features, but can you describe it? Uh, other features? Can you tell me, like proportion as far as like uh, legs, arms, things like that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So it had so the way the head was, like, the head like it looked like it had great long hair all the way down. It didn't look like it had a neck. Does that make sense? Just had broad shoulders, long arms, arms that came down long. Um, the legs were long as well. I mean, it just, it looked like um, just a, <laughs> it looked like what Bigfoot looks like on TV. And it looks like what we've, people have seen. Were there, uh, as far as the creature you saw, were there any like human-like qualities? So the, the arms, the legs, uh, that's what, what I was telling you, uh, those, it looked like, I mean, it just looked like a great big person um, and very distinct. I could see it. It's just like I could see a person walking away. Its arms move just like a person would move. Um, its legs bent and, uh, you know, its knees bent it, it, as it walked away. It was just like a, a gait of a person. And ap after this thing walked off, what did, what did you do after that? So we. We left, we got we, we got in the boat, we put our poles down, we started out back out of the, the I guess it was the valley with the hollow we were in. Mm -hmm. As we're going out of the hollow, we're, we're sitting down 
uh, in the boat seat because it's a bass boat. There's two seats, so we're sitting there. Or we're just talking about this, talking about what it was. What was it? What? I mean, we're we're both just kind of just don't have a clue what we just saw, and we're talking about it, and we're just trying to get it all in. And behind us, about 20 yards, maybe 30 yards, um, there was a big. Um, I don't know. It, I, have you ever heard a rock get thrown in the water and it makes a big come? Yeah. <laughs> big sound. Right. Right directly behind the boat, about 20 to 30 yards behind us, something, whether it be a big fish or something else, uh, a rock or something, hit the water behind us and made that sound. And you can see the ripples in the water. And we left. We went back to the boat ramp, loaded the boat, and went home. And I'll be honest with you, I have never been back to Sutton Lake since place. I've tried to uh, knock holes in it and look at it, figure it out, but it's no. It, it is what it what it was. Uh-huh. This experience had a huge impression on me. Um, not that I, I mean, I go in the woods all the time. I'm in the woods all the time. And that experience um, kind of kind of freaked me out, not knowing because I mean I I'm in the woods, I see things, I see deer, I see bear, I see you know all that stuff. Um, and you know I've come to the realization that yeah, there are things out there that we can't explain. Yeah. Well, we uh, we want to thank you for your time. Uh, we were really gracious for you know you sharing your story with us and, and I'm, I'm hoping we can uh one day get up meet up together and uh go out there and check it out in person yeah yeah sure